Hello. Can you hear me? Are we live? <laughs> cool. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Irena Haidu, and thank you so much for joining us tonight here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, students of the Dusseldorf Art Academy. Yeah, tell. Um, I guess today we will start with the uh, flames. Um, this candle that you see right there is a um, candle that is currently hanging at Gallery Max Meyer, uh, where Hugo Export, uh, an oral corporation, is um, joined forces with uh, Max Meyer, soon to be Gay Game Behar, um, to present Carrier, which is a Canova economy. Um, it is very strange that you are there. Most of the students, I guess, where my work is, I'm not, I'm not there. <laughs> I'm somewhere else. The work that the Malte Mandel, Malte van der Maiden has made this candle for is called by candlelight. And um, it's installed to this kind of mirror like double flame, flaming um, candle holder. And the flame that lights it is, comes from a piece of debris from the burning of uh, the Cathedral de Notre Dame in Paris a couple of years ago. One of my friends works for the Paris uh, firefighters and has provided me with a little piece with which we um, light the candles and kind of to make this flame come alive and have a life afterwards. Um, this piece was also hung at the Swiss Institute last year, which is probably a good uh, start point because it, it, it is there that uh, one of the oldest work that I have ever made, um, which is a rendition of uh, Mikhail Bugakov's uh, Master Margarita, was also lit by this flame. And at the time when I was writing about this exhibition, I was really thinking about Paris because um, Bulgakov's Master Margarita was somewhat finished before Bulgakov's death and started in 1928 and kind of uh, almost finished by 1940. And then censored heavily in the Soviet Union and Bulgakov's friends have carried the book out kind of chapter by chapter from the Soviet Union. And it was published in Paris in the 1960s, 63 or 64. What I really liked about this book always is that it had a will. Uh, and this will, I think, carried it out. Um, in it, there is a very specific flame. Because Bulgakov was a playwright who was heavily uh, censored in the Soviet Union and then kind of canceled, canceled to a degree where he was forced to write a novel and he wrote a novel about a playwright who was canceled. Um, while writing a play about uh, Pontius Pilate, who in Bulgakov's opinion and of many others is uh, the greatest coward that has ever lived. And this book somehow becomes a book about love and courage. Um, and in it, a character called Voland descends into Moscow um, and wreaks havoc and, and, and decides to mount a variety play and make um, the freedom of this author that has been canceled and put into, into um, an insane asylum uh, possible. He who has burned his manuscript, his manuscript is returned from fire. And that is the fire that kind of, um, in the end, in this um, novel, brings art back to life, I guess, um, for all of us and the book uh, from the Soviet Union into the rest of the world. So it was very inspiring to um, be writing about this uh, film that I've been making since 2009. I've started making remaster kind of as a secondary program in all my exhibitions. 
So I would make an exhibition somewhere and then I would use the infrastructure of the gallery or the museum or wherever I was um, to make uh, scenes, either audio or video or costumes, um, recordings for the film. And as kind of um, productions got bigger also, this kind of background program got bigger. Uh, including a documenta and uh, the show at the Renaissance Society, for example, we had quite a nice background budget to film uh, scenes from the film. So it becomes this accumulation of whatever infrastructure was available at the time over a long period. And last year, it um, was nearing completion, still finishing it up, but I was ready to show one of the scenes from the film at the Swiss Institute as a kind of scenography. And, and I think it is scenography that first brought me to think about art in general. When I was um, quite small in the, 19, in the 1990s, early teens, um, the national bank and the entire economic and um, state infrastructure of the former Yugoslavia collapsed. And my mom worked as a statistician in the national bank, Bank, and was fired and I had to take up she was always very honest about money and uh, to take up jobs uh, to bring a little money in so that we could have enough over the month. And one of my jobs was cleaning props before uh, they hit the stage at the Yugoslav Dramatic Theatre. I would clean them and notice that there was something fantastic that was happening when these props would enter uh, the frame of the stage. Um, they wanted to act as much as the actors, this, this status that they had as things was completely mute afterwards in this frame of art, which was uh, the stage. Um, and that was something kind of very important and poignant for me, I guess. And I've been thinking about, for example, the exhibition space at the Swiss Institute, which on the bottom floor had a kind of a variety theater because it was showing on a timer with lots of effects. This. Um, Black Magic Act scene, this scene that Voland, kind of a standing for Satan, is enacting uh, in the book, Master Margarita. And then on the second floor, we created a scenography where we would make another scene, which is this scene by candlelight um, and extraction of the master, which we did. A scenography where people could kind of feel the desire of the entire space to act and to kind of witness um, the mutual making that happens when uh, we enter spaces that uh, have life in them. Yeah. So yeah, at the same time, the Notre Dame burned and I was writing about this flame that Bogako was using to burn his books and the master in the book is using to burn his manuscripts and uh, something happened and this work by candlelight deserved its own light. So what I could talk about also is what is at uh, Max Meyer right now, because you're there and you could go. <laughs> we don't have any lights that are usually uh, associated with uh, nice galleries in this space. One of the really beautiful things about the Schmele House is the Schmele House, um, is this uh, concrete walls which make beautiful ac acoustics. But one of the shortcomings of the space which scared the crap out of me uh, was that the exhibition space is usually in the basement, <laughs> which is something that I fear. Um, because basement is usually, you know, and it kind of looks perfect, you know. Uh, it's the color of the Kunsthalle, it's not concrete, but it's this beautifully cast um, cinder blocks out of concrete that are protected and uh, carry transactions and uh, speech very well at the same time. But uh, we had to kind of devise a system that would not denote all labor on the lower floor kind of um, post electrical, you know, this kind of um, labor in the West or that sustains um, a kind of relationship to things that Evo export is not interested in. Um, so electrical light, uh, concentration camp light, production line light, um, light inside of um, alienated labor uh, complexes, Amazon, um, uh, and many other factories all around the world. So 
we needed another light in there. So the Notre Dame kind of seemed a good thing there because it would bring a kind of medieval feel into the space, I think. And what would happen to this flame if it wasn't burning the cathedral, for example? What should we show there? And then um, we devised a device which would bring the natural light into the, um, the basement, which is a system of mirrors which carries daylight and sunlight downwards. Um, the economy that we have made together is called Carrier. I, I don't want to talk too much about it. You can transact there by visiting anytime. I think, I think you have to make an appointment still, but you can still go. You can also just walk in and then make an appointment. But there are many things in there and they deal mostly with um, thinking about uh, and enacting uh, the economy that Yugo Export has been making since uh, 2016. Maybe for those who don't know what Yugo Export is, I can say something about it. Yugo Export is um, crafted and incorporated literally and um, as a kind of Kunstwerma uh, in the United States, first in 2015, as a copy of a former Yugoslav infrastructure, also called Yugo Export, um, that has folded just in 2013, so it has gone bankrupt over the 1990s when there was a kind of huge recession slash civil war and financial war um, in the Balkans. And then um, in 2013, it fired all its workers and um, sold in 2016, in December, last of its um, infrastructure, which was real estate downtown Belgrade. Uh, I was following it closely because I was really interested what would happen to this company. Its copy is, is brother or sister, maybe brother, because I always want to think about Yugo Export as a, as a she, or a, I guess there, as, a, as a they too, because it's a, it's a many, not just me. Um, its a brother is a Yugo Import, which is a company that man, manufactures weapons. And the Yug uh, means South in most Slavic languages. So it's something that issues from the South, which is imported and exported. And I always thought about making history as this kind of an import-export business. <laughs> um, this is so weird, I'm making myself laugh. Okay, hopefully that will, it will be funner during the Q&A. Yeah, so Yugo Import is the only company that kind of survived um, the war in the 90s and still is quite good. And it's a company that um, is exporting weapons kind of to the opposite sides of um, conflicts that NATO and uh, kind of the West is um, also involved with. And in Castle, during the Comenta 14, it seemed like a perfect opportunity to um, use the infrastructure that was there, Yugo Export, that was um, weapons exporter and apparel manufacturer and to show its process of incorporation as a public artwork. So in 2015, uh, you go, your export uh, was made as a copy in, uh, or an avatar in the United States under the same name. Uh, because in the United States, since the Citizen United ruling, um, corporations are people and I really very much wanted Yugo Export to be a person. So, or, or she at the time. Um, and yeah, we filed the Yugo Export Articles of Incorporation in Illinois as Yugo Export LLC. And what that also did is it allowed Yugo Export from the US, my copy, to receive tremendous tax breaks and, um, well, 20%, yes, and uh, kind of free. Medicare and retirement for any women that I have employed that are over 50 years old, which is everyone I wanted to employ because we were for Documenta, we were making kind of a collection. Um, all companies from the West, which is kind of the result of the failure and collapse of Yugoslav economy, uh, to kind of clear the real estate and, and privatize the former manufacturing infrastructures. Um, all companies in the West would receive like kind of large and incredible deals from the government, I guess, first of Yugoslavia, then of Serbia, Montenegro, and now Serbia. So we could operate 
from the U.S. much better than, I mean, I could survive from the U.S. where if I was to start this business in, uh, in Serbia, um, that would probably not be possible. So it was both a kind of an economic move. And since then, you go explore has served kind of as a studio. There were a lot of oral images over time and think of a different type of economy. An economy that is a home, because in Greece, I've learned what the word means, and it costs means home. It's not this kind of um, weather that uh, we're told it is, uh, we're looking at it, but there's a storm, we can't do anything about it, but it rains on us. <laughs> We're thinking about an economy that would, uh, through art and, and through making art, create desires, something that kind of art is, is very good at and very well known for. And, some, and, and the kind of people that are responsible in a kind of a situation that we are living in today, which is where everything is disposable since we've made people and things disposable through the way that we image things and make desires through images, historical and um, regular pictures, which is kind of the desires become Western image. They annihilate everything they image. And in the end, when we are gone, I guess, all of them circulating in fiber optic networks, which will be there after we're gone, um, will uh, be available, whatever, I guess, alien art, um, artists that come to visit us after we're gone will be able to see. And it will image everything we've destroyed, um, I guess. So this kind of death drive within the Western desire and its images is something that Hugo Export is trying to um, reform, I guess. This is because time is short. <laughs> and it's time for, to think of an art field as a field that could maybe, because it has brought us here, make desires that do not want us to dispose of ourselves. So in a way we have to want what we do not want and our field has to make people want to do that. <laughs> I personally am not a person who is very re reacting ever very well to um, commands. Um, I have to be seduced to do something. So I guess the slowness, the transactions and the aesthetics of Google export are there to first change speed, but also load um, an aesthetic economy, uh, which supports itself and proves this equivalence between people and things, which I think for me, the prop already did with this kind of um, desire to act. Um, at Galerie Max Meyer, we have like a table from which you can pull a rubbing. And it comes from this incorporation table from documenta where people could come in for a price of a kind of a regular document from the city hall. Um, they could rub a copy off and take it home. And the maxims of Yuga export were um, written there and also orated at the same time in Athens. So unavailable anywhere else except as a kind of physical act where you pay for your labor. That's a good question. If anybody is taking notes, what to ask? Why is it okay to pay to work? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, <laughs> and in Athens, there were naked iterations where the marble was treated as a copy because in Athens, um, papyrus has the status of the original. And every Friday, uh, one of the members of the what we call the Army of Beautiful Women, one of the members uh, incorporating Yugo Export both physically and literally, would come out and orate this for citizens of Athens and Greek, as they were in um, ancient times. This is kind of an archaic form, this oral form. That's the way that the Athenian state used to announce any tribute, event, historical importance, taxes. They would put documents on the street in a form of a stale, a marble stale, and then once a week an orator would come and read them because most of the population was illiterate. Um, so you can see one of these tables in, uh, at Galerie Max Maya, and this time it carries another text, which is uh, about a rock and about the idea about love and how it shifts weight and what weight is. And I was um, 
super enthusiastic because for me, the Schmere house was kind of a giant rock when I looked at the um, documentation of the house online when there was no buildings around it. Really beautiful rocks. So it was a kind of a love letter to the building. Um, and it is, a, it is about love, I think, and also rethinking this um, context of brutalism, which in the West is, I guess, brutal, <laughs> because it draws from these aesthetics of the factories that became camps, that became art spaces. Uh, and to kind of rehabilitate it to a place of communal living and communal acting, which it is where I come from, at least. Um, yeah, I'm umming a lot and because I, I'm hearing myself, I'm interested. Um, yes, so I guess what we could do, if you don't mind, um, is talk a little bit more about what uh, the Maxima Bugle Export are and how it is different, I guess, because of its base in the Balkans culturally. Um, uh, and what I perceive kind of as a way to um, start practicing another way of imaging things. One second. Let me I have a lot of images which I have saved for Q&A. I much prefer talking to you like this. So we could start a little bit historically. For me, one of the key moments in history of the world, I guess, what, from where I come from is where in the ninth century in Byzantium, uh, the capital punishment was switched from punishment by beheading to punishment by blinding. Um, in the first one of ninth centuries, I guess after Christ, their um, vision and the role of vision in authority has increased exponentially. So even if you wanted to be in, in, I guess, in some kind of administrative office or be a ruler, you could not have be cross-eyed or not have 20-20 vision because to see was to judge properly and to see the truth. And, yet, and a ruler had to judge properly. Um, so in order to, that gained such a value that in the ninth century, um, to take eyes from an individual meant to void them as a person. At that time, already in, in Byzantium, there were, you know, places for the homeless, for the blind, for people who um, had some kind of physical um, issue, functioning as a regular um, healthy individual. Uh, so for the blind, for the deaf, for the people who would not speak, uh, people who were paralyzed, there were already houses um, that took care of them in public. However, the people that were blinded as a form of capital punishment were, were denied this care because the act of blinding made them into a thing legally and anybody could kill them or dispose of them any way they liked. And this uh, legal codex uh, spread through the entire Asia Minor region in the Balkans. And as the Ottoman Empire was spreading kind of eastward, um, Already in the 13th and 14th century, this was like law pretty much in every country. So as the Ottoman Empire was spreading, they no longer had to castrate a king or assassinate the king to take over land. Um, they only had to kidnap a person, blind them and return them. And you see many rulers in the Balkan regions already in the 13th and the 1400s, especially in the 1300s, um, rulers being <laughs> deposed this way and then becoming monks, I guess. Welcome to the... Well, together with their wives as well. So uh, they would be shown in this kind of monastery that they would then raise uh, as uh, seeing when they were becoming monks and as blind when they were with crowns, rulers. So there's some kind of really strange relationship to taking away vision 
as uh, acquiring another sense or another kind of authority. And when the entire region became uh, taken over, <laughs> um, there was no way to render history or uh, through images because this was done through fresco paintings and uh, writing, uh, illuminated manuscripts and documents and so forth. Uh, this was forbidden by the Ottoman authorities and uh, unofficially a culture of uh, recording history through oral telling developed. In Serbia alone, I think over the 500 years of the Ottoman rule, there was uh, five cycles of epic and lyrical poetry that has developed. And this, uh, these poems were uh, memorized by single singers, uh, Muslavs, who had this um, uh, single string instrument with which they would uh, sing uh, with their disciples while hosted by regular households, the history of the region in lyrical form. Uh, and Ottoman uh, authorities kind of caught on quick. Sure, these were not representational images and these were not um, uh, kind of written down documents, but they understood that this type of singing loaded an image and a historical image, the way, let's say, um, you know, um, Canova or Kurbe or, um, uh, I guess El Greco would load a historical event through a kind of Western painting with a, with a capital P. Um, so they started punishing this act. And if um, a person was caught singing these, uh, they would be blinded in one eye, kind of as a warning. Second time, they would, and of course their instrument would be destroyed. Second time, both eyes, which in the legal sense render them a thing. And third time, that time would be cut out. And each time, of course, the instrument was destroyed. So this kind of singers, which I think are very close to the kind of Meister singers in Germany, I was thinking about that. What could that be similar to, except those were not banished. Um, they were not denied hospitality by anybody. Like it would be like a curse on your house <laughs> if you did not allow them in, even though they brought in kind of a uh, dangerous proposition. Um, they traveled as groups where the person with kind of least uh, dismemberment was the youngest and learning and the people with kind of the most dismemberment who were blind and without tongues were the masters. Um, and the topic, what was really interesting about the poems, of course, they were different for everyone. They were not like regular images that you can copyright or uh, standardize or with that, uh, even though they communicate quite fast um, and on all channels, the same to everyone, these were not like that. An oral image is something that everyone has of their own. Um, it loads different for everybody else and it cannot be owned by anybody. Anybody has their own version. So these uh, singers would change history. So like where there was a defeat in battle, they would um, say that there was a win or where there was a tragedy, um, there was maybe a bigger tragedy. Somebody who was a coward was brave. Somebody who was um, beautiful was ugly and so forth. So they changed uh, events and entertained people this way. And for the lyrical poems, most of the protagonists were women because uh, at that time men would, uh, you know, born, um, they would get killed off in all these rebellions and the heroes of these songs were the women, their wives, their sisters, women who were helping out. So it is beautiful and also mythical um, entities that were um, personified as women. And when, I guess when their instruments would be confiscated, when they would be caught singing about these women, <laughs> um, they developed a kind of aesthetic within their instrument. So almost all the bows of the gusle instrument, because it's a string instrument, and then there is a bow that you string. So you strum with your fing with your fingers and also beat the, the instrument, which is kind of like a rudimentary cello or, or cembalo or something. Um, and you bow with the bow as you speak sing, kind of a epic parlando or something. Uh, and 
those bones are usually in the shape of, kind of abstracted of a snake, or uh, literally carved in the shape of a snake. So it was believed that when uh, they, were, they were caught by the Ottoman authorities, the snake would come alive and defend both the singer and the instrument by biting the person who was trying to murder them or blind them or punish them. So there's this kind of beautiful, and then if you're, if you're up for it, in Belgrade Ethnographic Museum, this beautiful collection of these instruments with the, with the snakes. Uh, at, uh, in the gallery, I made one of my first, I think, still lives. Um, one of them uh, holds the, it's an oval thing. And it's the only mirror, even though everything is a mirror, it's the only kind of uh, mirror in the space. We have lit it in a way that when you stand in front of it, you do not see anything. <laughs> but if you stand a little bit to the side and wait a bit, it will reveal itself, this image. It's a kind of a 3D rendering of the gusla instrument and a real snake as a bow. And uh, one of the by candlelight uh, holders, because that is another light that lights the exhibition. Um, yeah, vertical. I was really interested in vertical and something that would be kind of at a height of a mirror where people could look at themselves. Um, oh, again, interesting. Um, Sorry, a little more water, maybe the ums will go away in a second. Let me see. I like this, that I'm going away a little bit. So, to finish the story, uh, by 1800s, there were, I guess, five cycles of epic poetry with multiple forms in it, about many events, personal and historical. And Vuk Stefanovic Karadzic in the 1800s, this really funny guy who had a um, really problematic leg, so he, was, he had a wooden foot at some point, uh, I guess from knee down went all around what was then, you know, Serbia or Balkans that was under the Ottoman occupation and did something quite illegal. He wrote down these poems. And then to avoid punishment, and because he had no money, he, he went from, I guess, from singer to singer and collected even versions of them. And then he came to Leipzig and Castle in order to avoid punishment. And at that time, I guess, Goethe, the Bruder Grimm, and uh, Adelung were, uh, reforming the German language, if I'm not wrong. And he reformed the Cyrillic alphabet together with them and showed them these poems. And uh, Goethe and the Bruder Begrim started translating them into German because especially Goethe really liked them, especially the female protagonized um, lyrical poetry. So in a way, what is so beautiful about this moment that even though there was no solidarity with the region being the kind of, uh, I guess, Rohan of Europe during the Ottoman Empire, um, during the Lord of the Rings and whatnot. Um, kind of a book, Stefan Vichkarovic was also, let's call him book, because that's a mouthful. Uh, his name is book, which means wolf. And the reason he was called wolf is because at the time there was a plague going around. And in order to placate the plague, women would call their children. Um, after ferocious animals. And his name was Wolf because it was very, um, born very small. Anyhow, um, one of the reasons that these poems also are written down and we know these versions is because um, people like Bruder Grimm and Goethe helped um, print these and preserve this. Um, and they looked at, I guess, for me also what is interesting is that something happened in the Balkans that did not happen in the rest of the Europe and it's not just the Ottoman occupation. Um, the entire region did not go through enlightenment. So the way that the images are constructed today and the way education is constructed today, I guess your school is constructed today, has a lot to do with um, humanism, renaissance and enlightenment um, um, kind of reform in Europe um, starting I guess in the 1300s as well. So I think there is something 
in this kind of crisis of images and this higher that we're facing today as a field, there is something maybe to learn from the Balkans. Um, um, and an oral image, I think, for me is a beginning. And there's still, I think, Gauri Max Meyer maybe is uh, to think about, at least serves me to think about how a picture that loads orally would look like. I don't know yet if I'm right or not about that, but maybe you can go and check it out and see what it does to you. Um, I guess at this point we could start with questions. Is that okay with everyone? We're at 40 minutes, I think. Sounds great. Let's not um, go any further. Yeah, <laughs> Let's not start any news stories and we can um, maybe address some questions. Well, I'm going to say thank you now. And uh, I'm super, I understand that the Q&A is private. So goodbye to um, the general stream. And if you'd like to stay with us to ask some questions, I'm here. And there's a lot of pictures that could load if you like. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll make a break now and um, let's say we meet at 1950. We'll post the link uh, oh. and, then we can and in the I don't hear any. And see you soon. <laughs> Maybe one little thing before oh. we end the stream. Um, there'll be a workshop with Irene on Friday and uh, you can still register for it. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know if I'm supposed to hear something, but all I'm hearing is myself. <laughs>